Well, ladies and gentlemen from Switzerland and across the Central Eastern European region, I would like to welcome you very heartily to today's uh, CE Swiss Impulse session about robotics. My name is Oliver Bertschinger, and I'm on to welcoming you in the name of 13 other organizations across the region, which um, you can see here, actually, we got a, a new one. Uh, it's 12 organization together with mine, it's 13. So we got a new member in our family of uh, Swiss Central Eastern European Chambers of Commerce, which is the Swiss Kosovo Business Association, which I welcome also very heartily to our group. Uh, the C Swiss Simple Sessions were done uh, a little bit with the mindset of creating something like a TEDx talk across the region, uh, providing uh, you and Swiss people um, with uh, know-how and inspiring topics. But those chambers of commerce, they're actually very active. They do a lot for companies and for people between Switzerland and uh, Central Eastern Europe. So please check out what they are doing and join their activities. We also welcome you to do this. Um, <clears throat> Before we start, I wanted to give a, a few uh, remarks about uh, the setup. So uh, Professor Sigurd will talk about 25 to 30 minutes. At the end, we will have time for your questions. I really invite you to uh, ask questions. Use the Q&A button of Zoom to do that. Also during the speech, uh, you will be on uh, mute. Uh, maybe I have a slide here even. And there will be no video of you. Uh, we will end on time, which is at 11.45. Uh, the option is to stay on if you still have questions for a couple of minutes more. Um, if you have any insights to the topic, please um, send write it into the chat function. Also say hello, where you're from. We're always curious to, to listen where you're from. And you will receive the slides and you can rewatch the session on our YouTube channel, as you can see here, we will write all this to you by email. Um, before I introduce the speaker, I wanted to show you what our next input session will be about. We will talk about chatbots, same, almost like robots. So we will uh, talk about chatbots. Uh, in December, we will communicate the date very soon. So, Without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Professor Dr. Roland Siegwart. He's a professor for autonomous mobile robots at ETH Zurich, founding co-director of the Wies Zurich Translation Center, member of the board of directors of multiple high-tech companies. So he's also an entrepreneur. <laughs> he's a recipient of the IEEE IRS Pioneer and Inaba Technical Award and co-founder over of over half a dozen startup companies in robotics and one of the most cited scientists in robotics. His interests are in the design and navigation of wheeled walking and flying robots operating in complex and highly dynamical environments. He is also a strong promoter of innovation and entrepreneurship in Switzerland. So I'm very proud to have Mr. Sigurd today with us and with, well, the floor is yours. Thanks so much. So uh, probably you have to stop sharing, then I can share my slides. Okay, hopefully you can see the slides well. So it's my great pleasure and honor to speak a little bit about autonomous mobile robot moving out in our daily uh, lives. Um, and so probably give you a little bit of feeling what you can expect and where, where are the big challenges on these robots moving in our daily environment. So we all know these type of robots, which are the industrial robots, which are producing our cars, but a lot of other products. They're working 24 hours a day, um, the whole year uh, without really getting tired. And these jobs they are doing here in production, they are doing much more precisely than humans. Um, but this 
environments are extremely structured. You can see that this uh, whole plants are built so that the robots can really act in the environment. The environment is not shared with humans because these robots would be too dangerous for uh, um, humans and uh, they need really very precisely aligned um, system and structures so they cannot improvise and they can uh, only do exactly what they have uh, planned to, uh, doing and of course they need a lot of um, engineering skills to be implemented in these plants so i will not speak about these type of robots but about service robots or sometimes they call personal robots these are robots which are hopefully more and more appearing in our daily environment. Here you can see a video from Boston Dynamics. Probably some of you already have seen the fantastic videos of Boston Dynamics. Um, and uh, if you see, look this video, you think probably in the next Christmas, I can actually buy one of these robots. And so I will uh, spend more time with my family instead of cleaning up the kitchen. Unfortunately, I have to disappoint you. These robots are not ready now. Of course, they can move around. They can, for example, get on legs again. They can walk up stairs, but they still have a very diff high difficulty to understand situations, to improvise, to handle. Now, the question is, um, why is this actually difficult? This is difficult because we have tactile senses. We can actually interact with the environment. We have, we can feel with our hands. We can actually understand situations. And robots today cannot uh, do this and it will still re require a lot of research to get to this point. But still, today, robots um, can do stuff which probably even we humans cannot do. And I would like to go through first a couple of designs of robots, which are um, capable to do um, interactions and move in our daily environment uh, in a very skilled way. So this is one robot where this was designed by students, a student team from the last year of the bachelor. Um, and the idea was to have a wheel robot with uh, four wheels, like a car. It's about uh, 50 centimeters long. Um, two wheels uh, are steered in the front, so it's very similar to a car, but the wheels are not actuated. And they can see the two propellers. And these propellers are generating forces to propel the system forward. But thanks to these propulsion propellers, the system can not only um, drive on flat grounds, but also on walls and ceilings. So if you uh, arrange the propellers appropriately, you just move towards the wall, and then you generate the forces against the wall. You generate the force which actually compensates gravitational force so that it doesn't fall down, and the force which can move forward. So robots can, in some cases, do stuff which we humans can not so easily do, and can be actually then very valuable for applications in this. We will see more um, also direction Another um, limitation, for example, with wheeled robots is still that they are um, only capable to move on flat planes. Now, if you have a suspension system, which is an active sus suspension, which actually are in principle two legs, then you can much easier adapt to different environments. And this is something also which was first developed by a student team um, uh, called Ascento. Um, which is a robot which has two wheels, balancing on two wheels and has two legs or, um, which can actually adapt more or less the, the height of the wheels individually. And they started with a small prototype. This uh, figure is about um, 50 centimeters high. Uh, and now they're moving towards a startup company, which uh, you can see here. This is the newest type of the robot, which can then, thanks to this balancing and also the the wheel size and the legs um, move in rough terrain, but they can also move up and down stairs. So all of a sudden you have a wheels platform, which is not limited to on the flat ground, but can also do um, go obstacles and uh, then have a much a larger field of applications. Now, if you want to go one step, uh, go one step further, we've already seen walking is of course a very good option. But walking is quite difficult. So we started with uh, working on walking research for, uh, on walking robots, inspired by this this small video of the jumpy dog. If you see how humans, but in this case uh, dogs, can really move and very dynamically in very complex you know, situations and make big jumps and even walk on walls, our question, our scientific question, was: Can we actually build a robot which can do something similar? Uh, walking robots with four legs. 
Um, and the first thing what you can learn from nature is that we have um, a very sophisticated way how we interact with the environment. And this is due to our muscles and tendons. Um, if you jump down or you get in contact with the ground, you have the tendons which are preloaded. So you have some sort of an elastic element uh, in your body. Um, and humans have this and uh, animals have this. And this allows you to have much less impact once you get in touch with the ground because you have this elastic element which actually um, reduces the impact force. In parallel, this elastic element also allows you to, to store energy, which you can see here now in a model, um, a physical model of this system. And the deformation of the spring actually allows you to have a very precise measurement of the contact force. And we develop this further um, and integrated this concept in the legs of a walking robot, which is this robot, which then automatically very nicely adapts to different types of terrains. So you measure in each leg the contact force. You have the possibility to actually, um, there's a problem with this video, at least on one side, um, and you can uh, interact in, in very rough terrain. We'll come back to this a little bit uh, later on, um, how this now moves out to the market for real applications. Now, one critical issue with walking in rough terrain is that these robots have to understand how they best walk in terrains. We humans learn this. Humans, which are, as a kid, already moving in the mountains, they are typically very skilled as adults in the mountains. If you don't, don't learn this as a kid, you have probably more problems to walk in the mountains. Now, with robots, you also want to learn so that, uh, that you can actually adapt to very different terrains. Now, if you want to do this with a real robot, you would have to have thousands of training sessions. You probably will destroy your robot because it will fall multiple times. Uh, but today you can have a very precise model of the robot. And then you actually train the robot in simulation. So you have a model of the robot, you simulate different terrain, um, and then you can have thousands of robots training themselves, learning in uh, different environments, um, in parallel. And this allows you then really to have training sessions, which would be uh, typically with real robots. Uh, you would have need 100 robots or 1,000 robots and work for multiple years. You can do this in, in a day or less. And then you, if you have a good model, actually, you can transfer this knowledge the robot learned um, in simulation to the real robot. And you can see here what the robot is then capable to do. It can walk in situations where the terrain is very loose and still it's stable, it doesn't fall over. It can uh, do maneuvers with um, uh, walking in the snow and so on, uh, which uh, would be very difficult to pre program it. But the robot learns it in simulation and is then capable to move to different environments um, and do their jobs. Now, if you want to um co cover a big space without getting in in uh, issues that you have to cross the uh, very uh, complex terrain flying is another option and flying robots um uh, so-called drones are probably the field which has developed in the last 20 years the fastest it's actually not so long time ago it was uh, 2004 and um, where we showed the first time worldwide that you can have a, a quadrator four propellers which uh, are arranged in a, in a cube, um, uh, which uh, are appropriately controlled um, that you can fly with that, such a system. You can stabilize this in there. It was, the idea was uh, already around before, but it was not possible before because we didn't have the calculation power. We didn't have the sensors, especially the inertial measurement units, which are small and cheap enough to do this. Now this quadrator is a rotor wing concept, uh, like a helicopter. And they, is, it's known that they are highly inefficient. So our next step was to think about how can we actually um, be more efficient, have longer flight times, cover more space in the air, um, uh, uh, but without losing the, the nice uh, feature of a vertical takeoff and landing of a helicopter. And this uh, started also with student project is, is now a company in Zurich, which has about 140 collaborators. We come back at the end uh, from this which designed this swing on the system, which can actually get off the ground like a helicopter, and then it moves over to a fixed wing mode. And uh, thanks to this, it can fly 
up to an hour um, can uh, fly much faster, cover much more space. And uh, this has the advantage that you can then, for example, um, uh, take images from uh, inform land or cities and uh, get very, uh, very fast uh, 3D, uh, 3D reconstruction. Now we also try to push this even a step further and ask ourselves, can we actually fly forever? Um, by using solar cells, as you can see here on this airplane, um, which power the airplane during the day, but also in parallel charge the batteries, which are distributed in the wind. This has been optimized really for extremely low weight, uh, very good aerodynamics uh, for the size. And we have been able to show that, uh, that we can fly multiple days here in a mission in, in Greenland where the airplane was actually moving out, flying out about 100 kilometers to take images from glaciers for the earth scientists to get an impression of what is changing with the glaciers. In contrast to today, we people do this with uh, standard uh, manned airplanes, which is very difficult to operate in, in Greenland. You have to bring the fuel there and so on. And this new type of, of drone really allow totally new concepts how to get information from the ground. Now, up to now, all the flying platforms or drones which are in operation, they try to avoid to be close to environments. So we try to avoid collisions with the environment, and they are not capable actually to interact and to get in touch with the environment. The main reason for this is that they are underactivated. So in principle, you cannot generate a force towards the wall and still uh, be stable in the air. So once you want to generate a force against the wall, you have to tilt the whole platform and then actually become unstable. So this motivated us to de design a system which is a little bit different. And you can see here, uh, it's a, uh, a helicopter with four uh, propellers, uh, a six propellers. And these propellers can be rotated around the central connection to the, uh, on these beams. And with this, we have then an overactuated or so-called omnidirectional flying platform, which allows, um, as you can see here, to actually do a rotation, pure rotation, without moving forward, which would not be possible with another system, or do pure translation without tilting the whole system. Now, for standard flight and taking images from the air, this is not of high value. But as soon as you want to really um, do interaction if, if in the environment, you need this so that you can generate forces against uh, a wall, for example. And this can be seen here. This is a simple demonstration of the capability. So this uh, flying platform was equipped only with a pen. Um, and then you actually generate a force against a white wall. And then you move in parallel to the wall so that you can ride on the white wall. Of course, this is not um, the next generation of, uh, of uh, the tools for professors writing at the whiteboard, but you can imagine that you can, with this system, actually take measurements on surfaces. As you can see it here now, you can uh, go along surfaces and uh, take measurements in this, uh, this environment in the air, where it's very difficult to read um, otherwise. Now, for um, this uh, system, have this capability, for example, also to, to move uh, stuff around, to really do physical interaction with the environment, which was not uh, possible with flying platforms. Or you can actually teleoperate such a system. Here, the teleoperation device is a robot arm, and this robot arm gives force feedback, and you actually feel directly the forces um, acting on the flying platform. So you feel that the flying platform is actually touching, for example, the in environment, and you get a fees, force feedback and use this. Now, up to now, we have seen this um, system uh, designs for, be it flying or with wheels or walking, but of course, robots need also the intelligence to know where they are in the environment. So the first element is typically to um, uh, do localization and mapping of the environment. Now, um, there is different sensors. The main sensors to use today for localization and mapping in our daily environment are cameras and lasers. I want to focus here on cameras because cameras are much cheaper, lightweight, and they can be used on line platform, which is more difficult with laser, 3D laser scanner, which are somewhat heavy and, and powerful. Now, a problem with the camera is that if a camera system is projected in the 3D world, is projected on a plane. So you 
lose in principle the depth information. Now you can imagine, uh, you probably know that uh, of course with stereo camera, you can actually recover the depth information, but stereo camera need a lot of a big baseline if they want to really see the depths in, in large dis distances. But a robot is moving around. And so you can actually play with this by taking an image, then trying to find features in this image, which uh, are points in the image which are sticking out, which you can actually refine in an image taken from another direction. Um, and you can see here that the image, which is actually the camera on the robot, then you, you move this robot, you take another image from another direction, um, uh, which has some overlap with the previous image, and then you could try to find the same features again. And if you have these features and you can cor uh, correlate these features, it's uh, easy to understand that in principle, you can regain the depth information. And you actually can also calculate the movement of the robot. So all of a sudden, you know where the robot is in its environment, and you can rebuild the 3D environment. Now, if you do this, you can, for example, go and uh, use uh, your tablet and uh, go through your industrial inspection. Uh, this person had to do this every day by hand. So one day he decides to hand this over to a robot. So the first thing he makes, he uses his tablet. The tablet is using the camera and the so-called inertial measurement unit. And then actually um, in, uh, the system of the tablet builds a map of the environment. And the map is built out of these features. You can see the yellow points are the features which are sticking out, and the green line is the movement the robot did in this environment. Now a camera and drone can have the same sensors or more or less the same sensors, the camera and the IMU. So you can hand over actually this map and the trajectory to the flying platform. And then the next day, the robot will do exactly the same as the human. This allows really to have a very simple way to teach a robot how to move in its environment by only using a single, ca single camera and an IMU. Now, if you want to um, have a robot which is not only repeating what you did in the free space, but uh, which uh, actually is able to explore, it's getting much more complex. And I don't want to go in details in this slide, but it only shows that on one side and the left side, you have this, this um, the sensors, which are typically depth sensor. Probably you have also thermal sensors um, uh, and you have a so-called IMU, the inertial measurement units. And these sensors then are treated in uh, for getting, a, first of all, a dense map of the environment. So you reconstruct in 3D the environment. Then you have also an element which does localization. So you have then um, know where um, the, the system is in its environment. Then you have a, a, a total uh, planner, which based on the current localization and the goal, for example, moving 100 meter forward, um, it uh, plans a trajectory and then it executes this and updates always the map. So you're building a map in parallel um, to localizing yourself or the robot itself in the environment. And if you implement the, all this, which is a big uh, part of uh, a, lo a lot of software, um, and of course the appropriate sensors, you can then go to the forest and use a flying platform by exploring totally independent, um, autonomously uh, the, the, the forest uh, by giving, for example, only a task, move 100 uh, meter forward. And this is done here. So the, the person behind is only a backup pilot, pilot if something goes wrong. And the system you can see on the right, on the bottom, how it builds a 3D map of the environment. So if this is a dense map. And this is needed so that it can uh, avoid collision. The yellow line is actually the best trajectory. The ca robot calculates autonomously um, so to know where to go without collision with the trees and, and leaves. And eventually then the robot will build a map and after this uh, in front uh, towards a certain direction without any intervention of a human. So this uh, similar concept we actually uh, applied also to uh, the, uh, the DARPA subterrain challenge, uh, which um, was uh, finishing last year around this time. Um, the goal was that robots, be it flying or walking robots or wheeled robots, explore different type of environment, uh, tunnel environment, uh, cavities and urban in, uh, underground environments. And this should be done fully autonomously. So the robot will 
starts at the entry point. It has the localization here, so it knows where it starts, and then it has no clue what is around. It has to move in, so you can have use multiple robots, and then find and detect objects in this environment. For example, humans, uh, which are not really humans, but um, um, uh, physical uh, copies, uh, or uh, smartphones, or uh, backpacks, and so on. And then they have, have to record back where this exactly is. So they have to build a map of the environment. And uh, here you can see some, um, some elements how, how this uh, is done. So you can see that robot moved in this very complex environment. It has to move upstairs, has no information, no support from humans behind. And we have then multiple robots. You can see that there are multiple robots in different parts of the environment. Um, exploring the environment, there are also some challenges like um, fog and uh, and uh, very narrow passages. And uh, if uh, then the robots can share the the map. In some areas, they have no communication anymore. They move back then and then share maps with the with the other robots, and uh, eventually end up with this map of this uh, entire environment where you can see the different colors of different robots. So each robot went to another direction. And then they're sharing the map of the environment, and then they find objects in this environment. And so we had the uh, pleasure to actually win this challenge, which uh, was uh, probably one of the biggest robot competition worldwide, with teams from uh, from all the top universities um, um, last year. And uh, we were um, actually mainly winning because we had a very good walking robot platform also. You need the whole mapping, but you need also a, pla a platform which can really go through all this environment. And here you can see actually a moment where on the left side, on the uh, left side, you have the robot, the spot, which from the Boston Dynamics, which fall over. And on the other side, we have uh, our robot, which um, was uh, capable to actually go through different environments without really um, having issues and thus uh, winning the whole um, uh, competition. Now, in order to really do jobs in our daily environment, um, the robots have to go for, uh, one step further. At one point, they have really to understand the environment. And our environment consists in principle not uh, out of feature points or 3D structures, but it's really uh, about walls, chairs, um, objects, humans, and so on. And there is still a lot of work which has to be done that uh, we can successfully really do this. But you can see here some, some elements where the robot really moves in by using a depth camera and uh, a an color camera to build the environment, not in a, in a 3D um, uh, point glide, but really put different elements into the environment. And you can see it, um, it works pretty OK already so that you actually can classify or segment and classify different objects. And then you describe your environment as a semantic map, which is uh, much more valuable if you want to clean up a kitchen, for example. You need to know the semantic and you need to know the individual objects. And you need at one point also to understand what the functionalities of these objects are. So if you do this, um, you're getting closer to cleaning up your kitchen. We are still not there, and it will take quite some additional research. But um, uh, at one point, robots will automatically learn how to grab objects uh, with, with its uh, limited gripper capabilities, as you can see here. So the first the robot with its sensor uh, checks the environment and then finds the best way to, to grab this. This is today also done by having a learning systems, which are actually learned in simulation first and then on real system. Or you can then give the robot a task and um, uh, to go out uh, in an unknown environment, build a map, and find also objects, for example, in this case, a banana. You can see this is uh, still sped up. So um, uh, this uh, whole uh, demonstration still uh, are somewhat slow compared with what humans can do. Of course, it's still not flexible enough to handle all the different objects which might occur in, in our kitchen in the future. Now, we, if we look a little bit closer to what is feasible today, so with drones, there is more and more really data collection, um, which is done. For example, in agriculture, we had um, one system which can fly about seven hours. It's also a, a fixed wing airplane, which is um, here launched with a, with a special launch pad. 
um, which has some support with solar cells on the wing. And uh, so you can fly off and you can fly seven hours um, to really take images from, from the field. And here we have a camera, but we have also a hyperspectral camera. Hyperspectral camera allows to really analyze different spectral fields of the visual, but also um, auto um, electric fields. Uh, and this allows them to actually give um, some information about the status of the field. Is there probably not enough water? Is there probably some uh, fertilizer need? And this is a typical result of such a measurement. You can see the different colors or the different spectral fields, which give indications where you probably should go and interfere, where you have to do something so that your field is, is um, well developing. You can then uh, in parallel also do a 3D mapping. So you have the camera on board and it's a single camera. You can rebuild a 3D map environment so you can directly measure the height of your plants in the field. Or you can combine a flying platform with a ground platform. So the flying platform collects um, very fast information and then gives the ground platform some indication where to go to interfere physically. And so the physical interference can be, for example, that the SISMIS is actualizing, uh, analyzing different plants, trying to find the, the plants which should not be there and then actually remove them so that you don't have to spray a lot of physics, but you just mechanically remove them in this case, by just pushing in into the, this, uh, the ground. Another field where we, there is more and more potential application of robotics is uh, in constructions, um, in the inspection of different uh, environments. You know that the big construction actually started about uh, 70 years ago, and there is more and more maintenance and construction needed in this kind of construction. Some are pretty high up. It's very difficult to get, reach them. And flying platforms can help on this. For example, to do measurements here, it's a demonstration we did with some people from civil engineering, where you actually measure the electric field which is across um, the this uh, concrete, uh, where it gives you indication if the steel, uh, the reinforcement steel in the concrete is still in good shape, or uh, that it has to be replaced. Another field where I think there is a lot of potential to help humans that their body is not too much abused is construction. Robots can do a uh, very precise jobs, for example, building um, walls um, in a certain shape. We today as humans typically build mainly straight walls. As soon as you have to have a special curve, it's very difficult to do this. Robots uh, can very precisely move their arm and then in a much better way. Or to do actually um, the steel uh, reinforced um, concrete structures, which are also shaped by first having a robot to um, build up the, the reinforcement structure, as you can see in uh, here. And then you actually pour concrete into the structure and, and have immediately a nice wall without really having um, uh, to, to build uh, something around this wood and which has to hold it. So I would like to end with a couple of uh, examples only to show how we move our research actually to real applications. Uh, you have already seen uh, Vingtra, which started in uh, 2012 with uh, some crazy students, which had a vision and a dream, and today they have more than 100 uh, people. And they can actually do, for example, with their drone, a 3D map of the city of Zurich within six hours. So it's equipped with a single camera, um, and it flies. Uh, we can easily define where to fly, and then it... Um, it constructs the, the whole environment in a resolution of about three centimeters. So within no time, you have a 3D map of the environment, might, might be a construction site or, or in <coughs> agriculture. Another field is uh, this uh, new type of omnidirectional flying platforms where the idea is to actually replace these guys hanging on ropes, do inspection and maintenance by uh, a drone. And this uh, is already now also moving to its real applications where we can do uh, with different sensors measurements at height um, uh, in all directions uh, the omnidirectionality allows. You can also actually interfere with the surface. You can even 
grinding on surfaces, and here, for example, measuring of wind resistance, um, which is also uh, important. Um, the third example is antibiotics, which started with this vision, can we actually walk um, as efficient as humans uh, or animals? Of course, we are still not fully there, but uh, today these robots can really walk around in offshore platforms or industrial settings, um, equipped with the different sensors, can take measurements and um, inspect and uh, secure the whole environment um, in uh, the different um, interventions. So, uh, if we think about the future of, of robotics, what we can today is actually move around uh, in a very precise way. But as soon as you go to more tactile interaction, this is this axis on the uh, up, which in the beginning only f uh, navigation and the, at the red, uh, the red line is, is tactile manipulation. Tactile manipulation is what is needed in the kitchen, in the kitchen. And this is very difficult. Um, and this is probably the one thing which was done as latest um, with robots, even if as a humans, we don't think that it's so complex. So in a way, the robots can do some stuff better than we, but some other elements uh, are much better and, and the robots will probably never catch up. Um, Switzerland has, uh, thanks to the mainly the two main uh, technical universities, ETH Zurich and EPFL, built up a, in a very strong ecosystem in robotics. We have uh, various projects across the different universities. We have uh, different centers which uh, allow to really boost this technology and also bring it to real applications. This resulted in a lot of startups in the field. Some of them are having um, 150, 200 uh, collaborators already today, and some are still in the beginning to grow in the field. We generated also a lot of interaction with uh, different companies from um, industrial companies up to the big IT companies and uh, brought off uh, sometimes the name from an outside view that we are the Silicon Valley of robotics. So with this, I would, I would like to end. So I think um, the future of what is, is in unstructured, dynamic and dangerous environments where unexpected things will happen. This makes the whole thing much more complex, much more complex. It's a really big step from industrial robots in the structured environment to uh, robots in our daily environment. But, uh, but there is a lot of potential for inspection and maintenance, for sustainable food supply, for example, in the whole uh, food chain, in construction and mining, logistics, transportation, and so on. And I think what we learned as a researcher, and we, you can see probably, hopefully have seen also with some of the applications, humans and robots complement each other um, very, in most of uh, these tasks very nicely. We are extremely good in understanding situations, um, improvising, um, making very difficult decisions. Robots can do very precise and repeating and uh, dangerous tasks. And so I think that is um, collaborative robots, human robots um, doing these tasks together. With this, um, I, I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take some, some questions. Thanks very much. So thank you, uh, Professor Siegwort. Um, uh, I am very inspired by this. Um, this has shown, I've seen your speech a couple of years ago in another environment, and then you have clearly made progress. So some of the older robots fell down more. And uh, now one question I always had, everybody else to, to ask a question using the chat, uh, the Q&A function. Now, I was always wondering now these rescue missions that, you know, I felt when there was uh, this uh, nuclear incidents in, in Japan where the robots could not function. Is there only a, a problem of sensors and that the uh, nuclear environment is just not allowing them to, to actually interact with the environment or, what, or, or has there been progress? I think there was progress, uh, but it was actually somewhat uh, re really very bad to see that robots are not ready to move into this field. So interestingly, Japan invested a lot in robotics. They were always fascinated by human robots, which are even much more complex. These robots had no chance to go into this environment. At the end, they had some intervention with uh, robots. It was uh, simple uh, tracked uh, vehicles, uh, mainly teleoperated um, from US, which actually allowed to go inside. But you can see now this uh, DARPA 
um, uh, subterranean challenge we, we, we participated in. One. This is exactly this type of environment. You can see now today this walking robot, they were not available when Fukushima happened. Um, they would be able now to move in um, and to really do a lot of inspection. And hopefully in a couple of years from now, they will not only be able to do inspection, but also interventions. For example, closing a, or opening a valve or moving some, some elements so that you don't have to expose humans uh, in these, these very critical situations. Another question I'm, I was having is, uh, now if you look at these high rise uh, inspection uh, drones, how is it cost-wise? Or these, <coughs> oh, excuse me, I'm, I have a bad voice today. <laughs> um, how is it with the costs? Is, is this something that you can say, you know, of, of course in the future it will be cheaper than having a guy hanging down uh, some rope, but how is it today? And, and why is, or where is the problem to so really industrialize this or is it already industrialized? It's to a certain extent already industrialized. Some of these robots are in operation, but it, it, it will grow hopefully very fast. And now the big win is actually very often that you would like to have humans out of, of the environment. Imagine a, an offshore platform. It's quite danger, dangerous to have humans there. And the vision is there that there is no humans there. There's robots on the platform, which can always interfere if there is something needed. Because if you have to bring humans there, you have a lot of safety and uh, critical issues. Um, it's extremely expensive. Imagine these uh, people hanging on ropes. It takes much more time. So for example, in inspecting a wind turbine, you can, if you have people hanging on rope, it takes you about nearly an entire day, at least six, five, six hours to do one inspection. With a drone, you can do this in half an hour. So you have, you're faster and you have less downtime because this uh, wind turbine has to be stopped during this time. So there is a lot of additional effect which uh, actually make it, I think only today in a lot of application, very, um, very uh, nice uh, commercially, very valuable um, to use robot. But um, of course there is still some limitations. Humans, uh, we are extremely special with it, our hands and tactility and understanding. Um, still in favor, and, and I think a lot of these applications, there will be always a human in the loop in some way to give uh, the robot the next instruction and so on. I have seen there is a question about um, the car. Um, yes, autonomous car. I think this is somewhat a dream um, of, of a lot of uh, car manufacturers and, and other companies now. Um, I personally think it has a lot of potential to really change our mobility in the future, to make it all even more sustainable. Because today in, a, in cities, for example, we are sp spending using a lot of space to actually for parking of the cars. Uh, most of our cars, if you have your personal car, it's moving probably one hour a day in average, and is standing still. Now, if you would have autonomous car, they will actually um, easily pick you up and they will drive the whole, uh, whole time. They can do different jobs and uh, would be much more efficient. So it's much more often used and, and it allows you to actually uh, having no, no issues with, with the cars um, that you have to take care of the maintenance. I think there's a lot of this concept. Of course, the other thing is that we still have too many people killed on the streets. And uh, I always say that if today you would introduce a car uh, in today's society, it would never be accepted. You would say, no, this is not allowed. If you, have, uh, if you see how strict the rules are if you do manufacturing. So cars are still dangerous, people killed in cars. and. Autonomous cars eventually will really reduce drastically the number of people injured and killed on the street. And this is, uh, I think, a very important advantage also for the autonomous cars. Okay, so as usual, we stop right on time, a quarter to 12, but we still have a question, actually two. So uh, for the ones that are uh, looking forward to seeing you next time about uh, chatbots in December, uh, but we do have a, another question. But before we have the other question, this is the this is the the great thing about hosting this. You can ask a question yourself. 
And my question to, to, to you would be, how do you think the progress, sometimes I think, as you said, you know, cars would not be invented today if, you know, with all those compliance rules and, and law, et cetera. I also think of, uh, for example, a syndicates that don't like stuff being done uh, more efficient by non-humans. Where do you see, how is this, uh, the, the legal, the Anglo-Saxon legal system, for example, or syndicates hindering uh, actually uh, progress in, in robotics? Yeah, so I think it really depends a little bit probably uh, in the country, but in, in more in the more developed countries today, I think we have an issue that we even don't find people. So for example, farming, farmers in Switzerland, they want robots because they don't find people to work for them. So I think there is a lot of jobs. And as mentioned, I think a lot of jobs, humans and robots complement each other very nicely. So it's it's really, um, I think, not a big issue, but it will be in transition. Humans will do a little bit different job, but um, you will they will be less exposed to dangerous uh, work. Also in construction, it's very difficult to find people for in construction. And then these people actually abuse more or less their body and they have to take early retirement because they, they carry too much load around and so on. And I think the future in construction is that humans will be there, but they will not carry the big loads. They will actually um, coordinate the robots which are doing their jobs. So it's a transition. Transition makes uh, it's, it's always a little bit scary for societies. But I'm personally extremely positive that this will be a, a transition to the good so that people uh, don't do these dangerous jobs anymore um, and still uh, generate uh, um, revenue because they're in the loop and working with, with new tools. Robots are uh, the, the next generation of, of very sophisticated tools. Great. So we have a question from Uli Schwendimann, the director of the Polish Swiss Chamber of Commerce in Warsaw. Um, now, what is the percentage of private funding in your R&D? Yes, yeah, so in, in our case, I would guess it's probably about uh, 30%, which is somewhat unusual. I think most uh, research at universities still funded mainly from, from government, directed by universities or from European projects and so on. Um, we have a lot of uh, funding from industry um, which is open research and uh, laws recently also from the big IT companies. And uh, the reason why they are actually funding this is probably less about exactly what they, they are interested of what we are doing, but they are interested in the people uh, which are very skilled. Um, for example, in, in robotics, uh, this is very close to virtual reality, you know, augmented reality. So industry needs these people, especially the big IT companies doing all this uh, virtual reality, goggles and so on. And so they invest in principle on, on teams which are generating the next generation of very skilled people in this field. Um, and of course, the autonomous car industry, they need also people. They, they are very interested to be in touch, in touch with, with these people and, and um, actually support the the universities which are generating this next uh, this very talented young young generation of uh, specialists okay maybe a last question for me uh we also have people for medtech and and uh, the whole uh hospi hospital uh, uh world here today what is the future of you see all those robots in japan you of course you see them but also i've never seen a robot in the swiss hospital well there's other kinds of robots but you know standing there taking care of patients etc how do you see this uh, happening yeah so there are actually robots in the in swiss hospital but there are more for the logistics so they move stuff around and this is i think the, the most evident um ask for robots um, the stuff you see in, in Japan is uh, most of them is not really industrialized. It's a more or less demonstration from universities, from, from companies. It's again a lot of this task, which is at the patient side, is, is a lot of tactile and you have to understand and you have to speak with people. I hope that in, in hospital, they will be, have more robots which are doing these jobs, which uh, which are probably very tiring to move around and, and uh, more or less grab 
medicine in the in the pharmacy for the different rooms or to bring the, the food into different rooms so that the people in the hospital have more time with the patients and don't have to run around. And of course, in uh, in med in uh, in the operations um, or interventions, there are robots used. There, in principle, the robots are exactly an additional tool. So drilling in a bone, a robot can do a precise. But still, the human medical doctor has to really control the whole system. So it's only a device, which is the next generation of drill for drilling in bones, for example. And I think this, uh, again, is a, a field where we have a very nice collaboration between you and robots. And robots are doing some, some elements more precisely. Um, but uh, all the more complex decision processes, uh, humans are. Okay, cool. So I see there's no more questions. You have like five seconds left, but uh, Professor Siegler, it was a pleasure having uh, you with us.